Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. My friends, I want to take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in-studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret, it's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now, check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time, it's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. Well, hello, my friends. I am John O'Leary. So happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired Movement. We're going to be talking today about rebuilding community, about forgiveness and second chances, about social enterprise, working with formerly incarcerated, teaching conflict resolution, communication skills, and emotional intelligence. We'll chat, listen for this one, about apples, about George Washington, about Newark, and about sustainable agriculture, and wait for it, perhaps maybe most pertinent to many of your lives, we're going to be talking about beer, specifically hard cider beer. It's going to be an amazing story because we have on with us today an amazing guest who somehow through his life threads all of these disjointed topics together. My friends, do me a favor, open up your minds and your hearts, open wide your journals, grab those pens, and welcome onto the Live Inspired podcast, my newest friend, Charles Rosen. Charles, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. John, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. Oh, man. Well, we have a mutual friend who was bragging about you, and this guy knows everybody. I mean, he really knows everybody. And I said, who are the two guests that I should have on the Live Inspired podcast? And he mentioned somebody who plays in a little band called Journey. I don't know. I'm not familiar with it. And then the other, the other guy, he says, new. Charles Rose. That's right. They're, they're brand new. Uh, the other yeah. guy was Charles Rosen. And he started going through your story, man. And I'm like, dude, I got to have him. So I really am thrilled to have you on. And uh, it's going to be a special show because it's not only you. We're going to also later on have on one of your employees. We'll come to that later on. But for those Great. who don't know your name or your work, Charles, uh, give, them, give us a snapshot of the work you're doing today. Yeah, and it's it's always tricky to know where to jump into the conversation, but um, if I start with the idea that uh, about six years ago, almost seven years ago now, I started a company in Newark, New Jersey, focused on workforce development and urban renewal, uh, and, and, and how I got into that work, which we can talk about later, um, I have a deep background in in. in politics and um, sort of in in a run for Congress in 2010, I came to understand pretty quickly that, you know, I was looking to take on a job that really wasn't in service of the people I was interested in, in working with or serving. Um, and so that led me to Newark because I live in a suburb just outside of Newark called Montclair, New Jersey. And, and I, I, I saw around me a huge amount of urban development and, and, and building going on both in New York City. I'm only a 11 miles outside of New York and, and in cities like Newark where I was seeing, you know, huge amounts of money being made by folks that weren't of that community um, at, at the expense of the people that were living in the city like Newark. So um, I felt that if I was going to engage in helping rekindle the Newark economy and, um, and, and, and work with the people of Newark, I, I had to kind of go in and, and understand their needs and, and, and work with the people, not either for the people or, or sort of in displacing the people. Um, so I started a company called Newark Farms, and uh, we were engaged in urban agriculture and doing other environmental work. And the majority of my employees, uh, as you had mentioned, were formerly incarcerated men and women. I, I think when I when I look at our work with the chronically underemployed, I mean, nobody exemplifies that more than than 
ex-offenders, um, people who have spent time in prison. Um, we've really built a system designed to kind of get them out of our way, if you will, and uh, and and they're kind of the forgotten lot in our communities. Um, uh, as an example, like 8% of the jobs are held by Newark residents. 8% of the jobs in Newark are held by Newark residents. So there's there's not a lot of opportunity for these men and women. Um, so we were working on a whole bunch of different activities and came to learn that the very first industry ever in Newark was hard cider. Um, apparently, George Washington only drank Newark cider. It was beloved by everyone in the 17 and 1800s. And what's funny is Newark cider, uh, hard apple cider, was known as the champagne of ciders in mm-hmm. that day. And in great Jersey fashion, they actually used to sell it on the black market as champagne, which I right. love. It's like Jersey's been Jersey forever, right? That's they right, were like, man. yeah, oh, Nothing's yeah, it's changed. a champagne, sure, it's champagne, right? So we decided to launch a cider and, um, and uh, we named it Ironbound Hard Cider after the Ironbound District in Newark. And um, uh, what it did, it, to be a cidery in New Jersey, we had to have a winery license, which required us to be engaged in commercial uh, fruit growing, growing our apples um, at a scale that we couldn't do in the city of Newark. So we ended up buying a farm uh, just outside of Newark. And um, what's been really beautiful is although my work started very, very focused on the city and rebuilding Newark, it's sort of blossomed into this idea of what does real community look like around food? So our workforce are, are include, uh, let's say, people from the agrarian communities in rural New Jersey, um, as well as people from the cities. And we've built this really blended, diverse community. So I've, I've got guys, you know, wearing their Make America Great Again hats sitting side by side with black gang members from Newark. And these guys treat each other like brothers. Hmm. And so it's really been this uh, almost unintentional uh, exploration into how do we address the biggest gap that exists in our country, which is urban versus rural. Right? If you think about it, every rural county voted for Trump. Every urban county voted for Clinton. And, and really, quite honestly, both sides of the aisle have continued to push all of us away from one another, right? And there's this division that that allows us to be controlled pretty easily, right? This standard divide and conquer approach. But but what we're learning is as we sort of mend those tensions, as we pull these people together, um, uh, we're we're becoming much stronger as, as, as the collective than thinking about just our own individual pursuits. Right. And, and I always think about this now, our, our form of agriculture, which is known as regenerative agriculture, permaculture, it's got a lot of names, is really about building a healthy ecosystem in the soil. And what that means is as we really focus on growing dirt, which is building the microbiological life in the soil, as that builds up, the whole farm gets stronger, right? The whole system gets stronger. So I've really tried to learn from that model that we're learning from nature and saying, okay, well, that's what community building should look like. That's what our company should look like. So as each individual organism in the system gets stronger, the whole system gets stronger. So it does not matter if you're an African-American gang member or you're gay or straight or Muslim or Jewish or white, whatever you are, as, as, as you grow sort of within the company economically, spiritually, emotionally, um, our whole system gets stronger. And I always joke, we look like the most busted Benetton ad you've ever seen out here, right? It's a bunch of broken people, but we're all together. We're growing food together and we're eating together. And, you know, every Friday lunch that we share, you know, break bread together, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome thing to be part of. So, man, I, I got I to gotta pause you just for a moment there because there's so many questions that spout. One is, it's my understanding that you weren't getting into this because you love apple cider. You weren't getting into this because you loved agriculture. You were getting into this because you were passionate about community. You, you saw a need that everybody else was running from. And so, you, you just went in to help fix what you felt was broken. And then the solutions yeah. began to slowly show up in front of you. Yeah, I think you know, jumping in to do the work without knowing what we what the work was going to be was both uh, terrifying and um, and and really exciting. And no pun intendedly, but this has kind of grown organically. Yeah, and so the first two almost three years of the business, we weren't in the cider business, and um, we certainly didn't expect to be you know engaged in you know agriculture at this scale. Um, and and yeah, as we moved forward, I think I think the point 
that you're that you're um, addressing, John, is this idea that um, as the mission of the business, and it's really got this dual mission of both uh, workforce development as well as environmental or agricultural repair. As those missions stay at the core, and we and those and we are unwavering in the commitment to those two goals, it almost didn't matter what business we were in. The cider thing was really exciting for us because, a, we had this deep you know historical connection to it as a state, and to me, place matters. Um, all of the work that I've ever done, you know, place matters, and and this idea that that new that New Jersey had this deep deep heritage in cider was important, <clears throat> but. Uh, as timing would have it, it's also the fastest growing segment of the alcohol category. Cider is exploding, um, especially craft and local cider. So I looked at it as an opportunity to say, ah, here's a potential revenue stream that's significant enough that would help fund our model of, of community building. And it was very, very important for me that we tried to build a business that was a for-profit business. I'm trying to prove a model mm-hmm. that says you can actually be in business, you can treat people with dignity, you can pay living wages, you can help repair the damage to the earth, and you can still make money while doing so. Right? So it's actually been great because um, you know my, my Republican friends are thrilled because I'm not talking about entitlements and handouts anymore, right? Uh, as I did in the political arena or the not-for-profit arena. Um, my my you know, progressive friends are thrilled because I'm really working with the sort of most underserved members of our community, veterans, immigrants, um, ex-offenders, really a huge swath of people that are what I would consider the most, you know, forgotten about in our communities. And, um, and for us, it's just business. This is just how we do business. Um, and, and I think what, what I'm learning is that the work that we're trying to take on is slow work, right? On the agricultural side, that we're trying to be innovative to say that we can grow food um, in this regenerative fashion, that we can heal the land as we're working it is really slow work. We just, unfortunately and heartbreakingly, just had to take 6,000 trees out of the ground this week. Um, it was devastating. Um, you know, later when you're talking to James, our crew chief, and a and, and, formerly incarcerated men. I mean, James and I were planting these trees together three years ago, and to take them out of the ground was heartbreaking. But we did so because we say, well, we're trying to prove that you need to grow food the right way. So that work is slow. And then the work on human repair is really slow. When you're talking about helping individuals shift out of a state of chronic poverty, that transit that transformative work takes time. And what I've not seen in the government, you know, our public sector or our not-for-profit sector, are any entities willing to put in that time, right? You know, the metrics they use don't make sense on this work. You know, somebody goes through a two- or six-week program, and they're supposed to have dealt with mental illness or addiction or issues of chronic poverty. It's just not possible. Um, And so we're living in an environment and an economy that's driven solely by quarterly returns, solely by, you know, shareholder supremacy, and I don't think that's what business should look like. I think that, you know, instead of this winner-take-all, zero-sum game approach to business that we have in this country, my feeling is my success shouldn't come at the expense of yours. Right? My success should actually be connected to yours. Mm-hmm. I think there's, like, plenty of pie to go around. And so I'm trying to prove that that is what, uh, you know, capitalism could actually look like, that that those of us in the private sector that are addressing big, you know, chronic issues in our, in our communities. Um, that's, there's a, somebody used a phrase that I loved. It said that we're part of the solutions economy, which I love. We're not looking to government for handouts. We're not looking to not-for-profits to address our issues. Businesses are, are taking on these issues that we're all facing and saying, okay, we can repair some of the damage as the private sector. So Charles, we're I'm, building that as we go. Man, I'm curious. Why are is this Newark guy who's been a producer and an attorney and in PR and a million other things and originally from Canada, why why are you so passionate about the least among us? Um, well, I, I would say uh, 
you know, it's a pretty complicated question that I ask myself a lot. I mean, I, I think I would say two things that, you know, weirdly, in, in, until I was involved in American politics, I didn't quite understand how Canadian I was. I mean, part <laughs> of it is I grew up in a society where it was rooted in the collective good, right? Uh, this idea that, you know, community um, as one of us succeeds, the, the whole group does. I mean, it's very much a Canadian slash, you know, God forbid to say socialist idea, right? I, I was just, we were just touring universities with my um, high school daughter and um, we looked at the University of Toronto as a Canadian. Her tuition is going to be $5,600 a year, including room and board. Um, slightly more to go to school here in the States. So I grew up in a society where everybody went to school. Everybody had health care. Um, so, so when I got involved in American politics and traveled you know, the entire country with presidential candidates, um, I came to learn that the American dream is really rooted in the individual, um, not the collective. It's rooted in this idea that if I work hard uh, and you get out of my way, it's kind of this two-pronged thing, I- I'm getting a boat and it's your fault that I don't have one. And, um, and, and, and so I think I've taken this idea of what community-based business looks like and applied it to, to a system here. Um, so I'm passionate about it because of that. And 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 it's maybe as silly as it sounds. Um, when I was a movie producer, I was getting pretty famous, and I felt what it was like to make money and 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 have fame. And it wasn't very fulfilling. Um, I didn't really feel very good about myself. Um, I have many stories, probably for another time, about you know hanging out with Harvey Weinstein at the Hotel du Cap during the Cannes Film Festival. It's not a good way to feel. You know, you don't yes. wake up feeling very good about yourself. And this work, doing this work is the first time that I've actually felt like, gosh, this is what success should feel like. This is what service to the other, why it matters. And um, I've never, both for my children and, and myself, I, 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 and I, I feel like, gosh, what else would I possibly do with my time, with my ex- expertise, with my money than this? You know, um, I think the idea of just getting richer for the sake of getting richer as if it's some sort of game doesn't seem very fulfilling to me. You mentioned earlier that part of your work now is proving this works. And so I'm curious, as you look at the orchards, as you look at the beer production, the cider production, as you look at the sales from the stores, are you beginning to see, gosh, John, yes, we're, we're proving that in fact this does work? Um, well, um you know, I think the answer is complicated. Um, I think parts of it are starting to really look like it's working. Um, I think, you know, what's interesting about having the cider um, in, in the alcohol industry, uh, a lot of what we consume you know, if you look at it from the consumer side, is about our own identity, right? I'll choose a beer at a bar so that a person at the other end of the bar thinks that I'm cool enough that maybe I can build the courage to go talk to her, right? Um, it's, it's about my identity. And, and identity politics, identity in consumerism is a powerful thing, right? What we drive, what we wear, what we eat, um, identity matters. So what we've really started to do is is build a very powerful brand around this idea of, of, of a Jersey badge, right? What does it mean to be from Jersey? Yeah. These are our farmers. These are our workers. These are our beaches. That brand voice is really starting to resonate. We've only been in the marketplace for less than two years, but I see people walking around wearing an ironbound hat yes. or, or a t-shirt because the brand's already starting to mean something. So that part of the success is, is really hitting. Um, people that come for events at our farm, we only cook on open flame. And we just had a party on last Sunday. We cooked a whole yak and a pig and a sheep and people were here eating together and drinking together. That's working. Um, but back to a point I made earlier, it is also slow work. And I think, you know, to be perfectly candid, it's a race. You know, do I run out of money before we hit a point of viability? Mm -hmm. And um, I know it's going to work. And we have so many integrated revenue streams and things are starting. But, um, you know, I can't make the trees grow any faster than I can make them grow. And um, so... So there's no question it will work, and there's no question that this proof of concept is, is necessary, but um, it's a question of timing. 
you, uh, I as, feel pretty good about it. As passionate as you are about apple cider, it seems you're more passionate about community and individuals that make it make it what it is. Are as you rebuild the lives of those you hire and you bring on as partners and and uh, the men and women who you are now rolling up your sleeves, working next to day after day, are are you seeing that work? Are you seeing their lives rebuilt? Yeah, you know, um, there are moments where. I am just overwhelmed. Um, um, I even have a, a friend, a, uh, an employee who unfortunately um, is now back in prison. Um, but we talked on the phone the other day and he said to me, he said, you know, I could not survive in here right now if it wasn't for our work together. He said, but our time together got me ready for this. And when I come out, I'm going to be ready to be out. And it was a really powerful moment for me because it broke my heart that Antoine was back in prison. It broke my heart. But um, the work seemed to still resonate. And he's going to be okay. Um, so there's a lot of setbacks. And, you know, all human growth has setbacks. My goodness. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know that better than any of us. Like, you know, it's always you know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, But it's in the work where the value is, right? So Mm -hmm. I think the people where I'm really starting to see transformation happen, where where people are going from being, let's say, a burden on the state, so many people come into our system and they've got somebody to blame, right? Always. It was the cops, it was this person, it was that person, um, it was the gang, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But then they get to a point where they're like, this was what I did and I have the capacity to change it. Our guys know the past does not define them and they have the capacity to define their own future. Mm. And when they get to that realization, it just takes off. And it's amazing and beautiful to watch. So lots don't get there. But when they do, oh my goodness, it's awesome. When you are on the Jersey Shore or you're having one of these farm barbecues and you know serving yam and lamb and everything yeah. else that you're serving up, <laughs> and you see someone either drinking your product or wearing a T-shirt that says Newark Farms or Jersey Cider Works, yeah. Uh, what what are you what do you think they're wearing that for? What, wh- why drink that product? What's that image that they're hoping they portray? In other words, what does your brand stand for? Yeah, I mean, you know, it we're <laughs> like everything else. We're sort of figuring that as, as we go, right? But what's great is it already means different things to different people. So, you know, we don't talk about you know our approach to working very much as a brand. Um, who we hire, how we farm. People discover that about us as they get to know more about the company, but that's not how we hold out the brand, right? We're talking about ourselves as being this kind of Jersey populist badge. You know, Jersey has no badges other than Bruce Springsteen, (laughs) right? There is no Jersey badge. When I owned my ad agency, I spent a lot of time working 15 years with Ben and Jerry's. I opened my agency with Ben and Jerry. And, um, And, you know, to think about how Ben and Jerry's sort of becomes a symbol for Vermont, Mm -hmm. Um, how they, you know, worked in partnership with the farmers um, in Vermont, the the people that they were sourcing their milk from, um, transformed an entire state and quite honestly a country, um, thinking about, you know, growth hormones in milk. I mean, Ben Cohen single-handedly got rid of RBGH out of milk in this country. Remarkable work, Um, again, through business. Um, So I see people gravitating towards a brand because maybe they know about our relationship with our farmers and, and how we support only local small scale family farms. Um, they may see us on the beach and know that we just sponsored a sick party at the Jersey shore Mm -hmm. and they know we're this super fun company that doesn't take ourselves very seriously. You know, we're a little busted, you know, we're like, we're like, you know, the Brooklyn, uh, hipsters without the attitude and man buns, right? So people <laughs> like that about us, right? We're just, you know, we're, we're pretty chill, like in this very Jersey way. Or people know about our commitment to helping rebuild community and our support of the individuals in our system, and that blows them away. Um, so it really runs the gamut, but I think what I'm most excited about is we're building a company that is allowing for outrageous transparency, Right. And I think 
today's consumer. I often wonder, like, what's the value of millennials? Because they don't do much. Um, but I realized, no, their, their power is as consumers, right? They care desperately about how businesses do business. Right. So you, you saw that situation in Philadelphia where, you know, two black guys were arrested for hanging out in the Starbucks. I mean, that got shut down instantly. Right. People said, no, we're not tolerating that. Mm-hmm. And and so consumers care. So the fact that we're building a company that can let us open the kimono as wide as possible and say, this is how we source our juice. This is how we work with our partners, this is how we treat our employees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's sort of open there for, for, for discovery for those employees. I mean, I'm sorry, for those consumers. As you look forward, are you, uh, are you sipping back that cider with optimism or are you uh, wiping your brow and uh, taking a big gulp? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I, uh, I was recently um, speaking at the Princeton Seminary and um, they were doing a, a a, a day conference on food justice and and they asked me to speak about you know my thoughts on food justice so I was trying to think about what to say and as I was driving to Princeton um, I, I kind of had this thought and I, I shared it with them I said well let's see I decided to take all the money I had to invest in a farm at the beginning of climate change <laughs> um, to work with a bunch of ex-cons who don't have any experience farming um, to go head-to-head with Anheuser-Busch <laughs> and Miller Coors. I said, arguably, it's the worst business model anybody could have ever come up with, and I should be scared to death every day. I said, but the reality is I'm not scared because I have faith. Like, I have faith that this is the right thing to do. I have faith in the guys. I they are my friends. They are my family. I have faith in them. I have faith that our apples are going to grow, and I have faith that people are going to drink our cider. So I should be scared, but weirdly, I'm not scared at all. Uh, it's almost the least scared I've ever been in my life because, um, it, it, again, as I said in the beginning, I couldn't really imagine doing anything else at this point. Um, and it's funny that you know when, when I meet people, although I've had all these great jobs and experiences of my life and yeah, I was a movie producer and this, that, and the other thing. Um, when people ask me what I do, I'm like, I'm a farmer. Like, I'm just happy to say that I'm a farmer, which is crazy. Cause my guys always make fun of me cause I don't do any farming here. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, but you know, so it feels right. So because it feels right, I'm maybe not as scared as I should be. We're going to be shifting gears in a minute into what we call the Live Inspired Seven Questions a little prematurely today because we have a, a special guest in the room with you here in a moment. His name is James Williams. Before I go into the seven questions with you, Charles, just yeah. get, give me a talk about James because I think he represents what you represent. It represents who you are and what you're really all about. I, I asked you to bring on one of your colleagues. You selected James. Yeah. Why did you choose James? Well, it's it's always funny to talk about James when he's in the room because it sounds uh, fake. But I, I uh, sorry, one one story comes to mind that I think kind of captures James' essence and spirit uh, the best. Um, a while ago, um, a little publication called Edible Jersey was doing a story on us. It's a small, you know, food publication or whatever, and um, the writer. Um, was talking to James and, and, and James happens to be spectacularly good at grafting trees. So for your audience members that don't know grafting, you the way you grow an apple tree is you take a rootstock and you graft a piece of wood from a variety of a tree onto that rootstock. It's called grafting. Anyway, James is really good at it. And so, uh, this writer, Fran was, um, talking to James about his story and she came to me and she said, Hey, um, James's story is amazing. Do you think it would be okay for him to be in the article? And maybe I used his picture and his name. And I was like, okay, I'll ask him. And I was kind of embarrassed to go to talk to James, you know, this huge guy. And I'm like, you know, this little dorky guy come up to him, go like, do you want to be in an article <laughs> in Edible Jersey about grafting apple trees? And so I asked him and he said, well, of course she has to use my name and my picture. If she didn't, how would my kids know that these are my trees? She has to use my name. And the article came out, and his son, little James, I think was like seven at the time, you know, had his dad read him the article to put him to bed every night for like three months. (laughs) And it mattered to James that this was what his identity was. It mattered to James that his son, little James, knew that this is what he did, and this is his role and his contribution to his community. And um, 
you know, that's when I talk about identity shift, that's what matters as, as human beings. And especially as men, we, we sort of have to find a place where our identity comes from. Right. And maybe it's as a parent, maybe it's as a, as a role model, like your work, John, but you know, wherever our identity comes from matters for a lot of these guys, their identity comes from the streets. Their identity comes from their role within a gang or their role as a drug dealer or whatever. Well, that shift in identity is everything. And so I think uh, James both has the capacity to uh, continue to learn and continue to um, believe in what we're doing here and continue to support me. Uh, and he always has my back, right? He'll, he'll, he'll tell me every time. If he sees somebody here that he thinks is screwing with me or trying to take advantage of, of me, because uh, I'm a pretty easy mark, you know, mm-hmm. he usually lets me know. Um, so it's, you know, it feels like we're in this together as partners. And uh, I like that. Well, with that being said, why don't you uh, float onto the phone line, your partner, our newest friend, James Williams. Here he is. Hello, how are you doing, Mr. Larry? James, it is an honor, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Yourself? I am awesome, and uh, the Live Inspire community welcomes you, and we are delighted that you're doing the work that you do, do today. For, for those who uh, don't really understand what you do, James, explain to them professionally what you're doing today. Well, today I'm a, a first-time farmer, and I'm out here in um, Bloomsbury, New Jersey, um, helping out with the um, farm and the cider work that's going on out here in New Jersey. And um, I'm loving my work at this time being. My, my friend, when you were growing up, were you imagining as a kid that, yeah, I bet someday I'm going to become a farmer. I'm, I bet I'm going <laughs> to grow apple trees. Is, is that what you were thinking? Nah, I was thinking something totally different <laughs> than that. <laughs> So, James, I, I this is the first time you and I have spoken. I know nothing of your story. I only know you have an awesome heart, but I, I want to hear a little bit of your story. So, uh, share with me where you grew up and what life was like as a kid. Well, as a kid, I grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, and that's like the inner city, kind of rough part of New Jersey. And um, I grew up in a very... Bad neighborhood, not too bad, but it was bad enough. And um, I grew up around a bunch of um, dangerous guys and some good guys. Family orientated a little bit. And um, at the age of 12, that's when I picked up my first dealings of the streets. Mm-hmm. You know, I stayed in school, though. I never dropped out of school. That was one thing I did. I stayed in school because I knew at the end of the day, my grandmother wouldn't allow that, so <laughs> I was the type of kid that did my work. I act up in school. I had a belt waiting for me when I did, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I, 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 stick, I stuck to the school. I did my chores, but my grandmother was always the type of woman that told me, like, I don't care what you do. Just do what you do in school and respect my house, so mm. I learned that, but... When I went outside, it was a different story. And that's when I became, you know, tied in with the streets. What eventually happens, James? Well, eventually what happened, I caught my first case at the age of um, 13, 14. Tell me what that, what, you know, what does that mean? Like, tell me well, what, the, what, what are you, what are you doing there? Well, well, what happens, you know, I stopped running around in the streets. So at the end of the day, I got caught up with the police and I had got my first, um, time conviction of a felon at the age of 13. Which leads to what? That leads to incarceration. But at the time, being a youth, it's not as bad, so I took it as a joke. So it ain't really bothered me at that time. You know, I came home and I still stayed in the streets. I stayed in the streets predominantly all the way up into my adulthood. When when do you uh, come out of jail for the final time? My, my last incarceration was 2014. How old were you, James? My age, I was 30... What's this? 30, I was like 35. So for <laughs> two, two, plus, two plus decades, man, you've been in and out of incarceration, in and out of jail, in and out of trouble. Yes. What At age 35... With society saying your life is done, man, like you, you can't be rehabilitated from this, what changed? Well, what changed is I, I, I knew I had responsibilities. I, I mean, I had 
my age was one. And like, I ain't going to sit here and lie, but my age was one. I knew I couldn't do that for the rest of my life, and I, I definitely didn't want to be in and out of prison no more. So I had to come up with, with some type of uh, understanding and grasp of what I want in life and be there with my kids. So that that dawned on me. Like, it took a toll. But don't let, let, me, let me not sit here and say my mom wasn't coming back out here on these streets because I definitely was. Mm-hmm. When did so you what took, go ahead? So, so what took the turn was I actually was outside, and a friend of mine pulled up on me, and he said, "Yo, man, what's what's your problem?" You know, I'm like, hey, "I don't got no problem." He said, "Listen, let me tell you something. You being real selfish right now," and that's when it dawned on me. He said, "Bro, you just came home from prison, like." You got kids, and, and when I'm saying you're being selfish, because right now what you're doing out here is you're thinking about yourself. And when he told me that, that's when it hit me. Like, wow, that that was kind of deep, because, like, he was somebody from the streets. He been in the, He actually just came home, too, but he and he was a, a major player. So he, 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 he enlightened me. I always looked up to him, but he enlightened me, and when he told me that, that's when I turned it around right then and there. When were you introduced to Charles Rosen? I was introduced to him 2000, 2000, what's this, three years ago. And man, you know, just to call it out, you're, you're kind of roaming the streets. You're, you're, you're in, in urban. That's all I, that, that's, that's all I knew. How, how does a guy who all you knew was what you knew end up leading uh, as the master orchard uh, grower of all New Jersey? Well, you know, a friend of mine, we had a, um, a friend of mine that was here before me. He um he sat me down and he talked to me, he asked me, he said, yo, I got a job for you. And I'm, you know me, I'm still biting. I'm still got one feet out on the streets and I got one feet in trying to do right. And he told me, he said, listen, man, if I could get you into this place, you got to come here and really work and, and, and really show that you're interested. And I said, all right, man, I'll give it a try. So I asked him, I said, what is it? He said, well, it's a farmer. I said, <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I started laughing, but <laughs> my grandfather, he used to farm. So I, I, I had a little concept of it, like, you know what I mean? So I said, all right, man, I'll give it a shot. So we had right. to do a couple of classes. And from there, uh, you know, March 23rd, 2000, what's this, 18, 2014, we took off. What what has surprised you most about the journey over the last few years? The growth. Coming to this area, coming to, to the job site every day was a, a task for me because I still was, like I said, I still was fighting, you know what I mean? This is my first job. I, I never had a job in my life. So at the end of the day, I'm out side person so i do like the the wilderness i do like being outside so i took that as a as a first step and then when i got here and i spoke to the owner the boss and he enlightened me he told me listen man all i want is 100 percent from you and i and, and, and from all of y'all i want 100 percent. and and you know what i took it i took that i looked him in the eyes i said you know what sir you got that i'm gonna I'm give you 100 percent. you know what i mean because he was genuine with his his game plan of inviting us from the city, inner city, to something new. So when I when I had got that opportunity, I took it and I said, you know what? I'm not gonna let nobody down. I'm not gonna let him down. I'm not gonna let my kids down. And I and I took the 50 miles every day to work, and I enjoyed it. Mm. I enjoyed it to this day. How, James, how do you get out there? I drive. When you I, I drive. Y- you were interviewed for that magazine article that Charles talked about earlier. What was it like when you saw it come out and you see your picture and you realize that the work you are doing today really is mattering and it really is touching lives? Well, when I saw that, first, I was cheesy. I was happy. I was blessed. I was tearing up. I couldn't believe it. Like, <laughs> I took that picture and I showed everybody. And then and then my friends that, you know, that I showed them the magazine, they read up in my family. They said, "Yo, we are very proud of you," and, and I couldn't, I couldn't do nothing more but be blessed, man. I, that made me feel very good. My kids, all my kids, they love it. They all got the photos and their little phones and on their <laughs> walls and stuff because that was like I said, this is my first time ever working. Like, right. you know what I mean? And I've been here for the longest, so I was like, 
I really appreciate it, and I, 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 I'm gonna keep striving for better. That's all. Do you view, do you view yourself today, James, as a role model not only to your kids but to other kids around the community? Yes, I do. I, I really do because I I do have people when I take my vegetables to the city and I take little stuff down there and I do a little schoolwork with kids. They look up to me because you know they don't really see a black guy talking about he's a farmer like a, right. a guy like me from the streets. If I tell somebody I'm a farmer, they be like, "You for real?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm for real. I grow organic vegetables." And then when I give it to them and let them taste it. And they come back to me and say, yo, that's the best vegetables I ever had. And I, and I feel so proud to say, yeah, I grew that. Like, you know what I mean? I show my pictures like, yeah, I work on a farm. Because the type of guy I am, they wouldn't believe that. They think, ah, oh, this guy went to the um, yes. farmer's market and brought this stuff. <laughs> when your little boy James, that first night that you had that article at home, was on your lap and you're reading this this article to him, just share with me how you, how you felt reading to your boy about the work that his dad is doing. Well, I felt blessed. I felt happy. I felt like a, a, a real man that really reached his potential of mm. doing what he's supposed to do as a father. That's like the first time I really took initiative to do something like that. Like, I got four kids, so he's the youngest and I brought him out here to work with me one day. And it's just a beautiful lesson to see that, okay, if I could do it, he could do it. If I could bring home vegetables and grow this because he know what I do, and he could do it, he could be a hard working person one day in his life. And, and it's so good. And he loved to see me work, and he loved the article. Cool. And he loved to know that I go to work. He liked to yes. come when he can. James, for our listeners, and you got, we got tens of thousands of folks listening all around the country and all around the world who uh, deal with their own struggles. So for a guy, a lady dealing with a storm right now, they are struggling with life. They've been beat down by it in the past. W what would you say to them right now? i say first thing i say is pray. Just, just pray. Take a moment. Take a second. Take time out just to thank God uh, uh, waking up first and foremost. And then ask the question. Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself what's your purpose because everybody got purpose of life. And, and once you realize that, when you look yourself in the mirror, face to face, eye to eye, you don't understand your purpose. And once you find out what your purpose is, just go for it. And don't hesitate to fall. You fall, get back up. Mm. If you fail, try again. If you can't, ask a question. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's something I learned. You know, as a man, I always, as a boy, I always been a man at the age of 12. I ain't had no father. Anything I did, I did on my own. Mm -hmm. Bills, apartments, cars, everything I did, I did on my own. Never had, never asked nobody for nothing. So at the end of the day, you got to work hard for what you want and realize in life, you, you got to go. It, it is something out there. You promise something. You mm -hmm. just got to find it. James, we have had the honor of in interviewing dozens and dozens and dozens of world leaders. And I can't think of a better guy to have on our podcast right now than you. Every single man and every single woman who's come before you has been asked seven questions. So I'm hoping I can wrap up this podcast by asking you seven questions. Are you okay with that? Yes, sir. All right, my friend. We call them the Live Inspired Seven. And the first one is, what is the best book, James, that you have ever read? The best book I ever read was Bob, Tupac's a cool of Machiavelli. <laughs> yeah? Tell us yeah. about it. I'm familiar with it, but I never read it. Tell me about it. I mean, Tupac's a cool. He's a, he's a, yeah. um, a powerful, smart, young, gifted guy that passed at an early age. And, and he was into a lot of politician and, and rights and wrongs and understanding the um, history of, uh, of America and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. he's just a, a naturally... He was a youth, uh, like some young guys look up to. He was somebody very nice in the, in the urban community. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, man, I'm I'm talking with one right now. So uh, as great as Tupac uh, was, that. James Williams is, is his superior. <laughs> Question number two, what is one positive characteristic, one trait, one talent, one gift that you possessed as a child that you wish you still possessed and exhibited as brightly today? Listener. Oh, man. Awesome. My friend. That's still with me. Yeah. Yes, listen. I like to listen first and ask questions later. That's awesome. 
if your home caught fire and all your kids are out, all your animals are out, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, just one thing, what would you grab? Hold on, you said if everybody was out the house? Everybody's safe, man. All your pets are safe too. So what's the one physical item you would grab? Um, honestly, nothing. I'm good. <laughs> Let it burn. Let it burn. Everybody out the house, the family, the kids, the pets, the animals, everything else could come back. James Williams, if you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anybody, living or dead, who would you want to sit down and talk with? Barack Obama. What, what, what do you, what's the first question you would ask Barack? How do you do? How did you do it? And when he looks back at you and he's looking up at you, what do you think he would say back? He, he would say it's a hard, it was a hard process, brother. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the best advice that you've ever received? Uh, actually, don't give up. Mm. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? Man, y'all heard that? That's I really wish I could just take it back. I wish I could. I would tell myself I would have been in a different place, but I, I, I do accept where I'm at right now. James, this is our final question, and it is direct, directed towards you. It has been said that all great people, and I am on the phone right now with one, James Williams, can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Oh, that's a good one. Very optimistic, eager to learn, and very teachable. James Williams, you are the crew chief at an awesome brewery in New Jersey. You are op optimistic. You are resilient. You are a bright light shining for a whole lot of other folks to look up to, man. And I'm so grateful that I had an opportunity to end this podcast by spending some time with you. And I appreciate you as well. Thank you. So man, I, I need a commitment before you leave and go back to work. When I am back in New Jersey, I want a personal tour of the farm. I want to see the orchards. I want to see those apples and I want to have a, a sip of that apple cider with you. No, hey, that'd be no problem. We, we will be waiting here for you. I look forward to it. My friends, that was James Williams and his partner, Charles Rosen. This is John O'Leary. What a podcast, what a day. And this is your moment. This is your day, Live Inspired. My friends, I wanna take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in Studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret, it's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now. Check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time. It's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio.